All right, so we're going to, uh, my plan today was to kind of review for you um, the recent changes in vaccine recommendations and, and uh, why they've been made and, and, and um, just to remind you that vaccine policy is sort of a fluid, ever-changing set of guidance and it's based on the fact that we do have new vaccines or new uses for old vaccines and then when we introduce a vaccine policy, it often changes the epidemiology of the infection that we're trying to prevent. So that means that we have to kind of see what's been accomplished and what hasn't, and then make adjustments to the policy to try and uh, fix what uh, might not be uh, the best outcome. So I don't have any uh, financial relationships. So um, as I said, We've seen a remarkable change in epidemiology of a number of vaccine-preventable diseases. And um, the policies that we have have really made a significant difference in terms of how frequently you're going to see vaccine-preventable diseases. Uh, we currently immunize children against 16 vaccine-preventable diseases in this country, and that's a pretty remarkable increase if we go back 10 or 15 years in terms of what we can prevent. So one of the things you can tell your parents is that with the vaccine schedule that we have and the vaccines that we use, we can make children much safer and much healthier uh, than they were even 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and, and again, vaccine policy is made primarily by two organizations. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the CDC is the, um, the committee that is uh, delegated by the CDC with the authority to make decisions about how to use vaccines in children and adults. So that's the official um, policy maker, but the ACIP wants to work with other organizations that take care of children and adults, and so the second organization that makes policy decisions is the American Academy of Pediatrics through the Committee on Infectious Diseases. And um, these two organizations work very closely together to try and develop a harmonized, uniform policy so that providers aren't given mixed messages from two major organizations um, as far as how to use vaccines, when to give them, who to give them to. So there's an effort each year to try and harmonize these recommendations. And as new recommendations are being formed, the or committees work together to try and come up with a single approach. Um, the ACIP meets three times a year. Um, it makes decisions each time. Uh, those decisions be, to be finalized have to be approved by the director of the CDC and they become official when those recommendations are published in MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. For the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Committee on Infectious Diseases makes those decisions. They need to be approved by the board of the AAP um, and they become official when those recommendations are published in the journal Pediatrics, which is the official uh, journal of the Academy. So um, changes are made perhaps at, at the end of every meeting. They meet at, uh, the ACIP meets in February, uh, June, and October. Um, and so changes are often made in the middle of the year, but every February, um, the AAP and the, COI and the um, uh, ACIP, along with the American Academy of Family Practice, ACOG, and the American College of Medicine, uh, update the vaccine schedule so that as of the February publication, you have the most current recommendations. So then they met February 21st and 22nd and it made some new recommendations. So the, although you have the current uh, policy, uh, there have been some changes even made to the uh, uh, schedule that was published in February. Three schedules are published each year. Um, we have a schedule for children through 18 years of age, a catch-up schedule, and any child that is more than one month behind on their immunization recommendations is behind and you need to try and use the catch-up schedule to catch them up. The catch-up schedule provides you with the minimum time between doses that you can use to try and bring children back into um, uh, being on schedule. 
And the reason we really emphasize that is that every, when a child is delayed, that means they're still susceptible to the infections that we can prevent. So we would like children to be on schedule as much as possible. Uh, the third schedule is for adults. I think you've all seen this. This was published. It should be hanging on the doors in the clinic. Um, it looks pretty complicated, but in fact, it's a very easy way to look at the age of the patient and what vaccines are recommended at that age. Um, and um, the important thing is that there is some latitude as to when you can give some doses so that you could pick the schedule that sort of fits your office practice um, and try and keep the children on that schedule. As long as you're within the range um, of what's recommended, um, you can, it, it's best for the patients that you take care of. Uh, the catch-up schedule, again, provides for each vaccine that we give the minimum time between doses that you can use to catch up your patients. And then the third thing, and this was introduced um, in last year's schedule, uh, because this has been available for adults for a long time, they've picked the uh, most common um, underlying conditions that may modify the vaccine schedule and then uh, give you information about what might be needed uh, for those patients or what might be contraindicated because of the underlying condition that those patients have. And so this addresses uh, use of the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine and a few other vaccines that um, would, would not be routinely used in, in otherwise healthy children but are very important in children with specific underlying disorders um, that make them more susceptible. And then this year they've modified the um, uh, footnotes. Um, the footnotes are really important. There's about six pages of footnotes now. And so when you hang the schedule up, it's nice to put the footnotes up there with them. They really give you a, a brief summary and what they've done this year, try to take many of the, the words out by making these into bullet points um, and uh, provide you with a lot of information that if you have a specific question about a, a child, you can go to this very rapidly find the answer to a number of questions that you might have about specific vaccines related to certain children. So now I just want to talk about some of the, um, the vaccine preventable diseases and where we are and, and, and some of the issues that you will face or are currently facing with some of the vaccines. Um, so influenza, so we are now 100 years out from the pan 1918 pandemic, uh, the worst pandemic of, uh, recorded in history. More people died within a short period of time related to infection than any other pandemic um, in history. Um, and um, although we haven't seen that again, we've certainly seen some years where uh, influenza has been uh, very severe and there's been significant morbidity and mortality. The important thing is that there's significant morbidity and mortality due to influenza every year. And some years it's milder than others, but there is no year where influenza doesn't cause problems for both children and adults. And I think the most important thing to remember is that children under six years of age can't be vaccinated. So we need to protect them by vaccinating around them. Yes, hmm? Six months. Did I say six years? Yes. Apologies, six months. Yeah, let's change that to six months. Okay. Um, okay, so that uh, we need to protect them by vaccinating around them. And then children under two years of age, down to, uh, you know, newborn infants, have a higher or equal hospitalization rate to adults 65 years of age and older. So they are very high risk for morbidity associated with uh, influenza. Um, and so it's really important that we make sure that they're all protected um, as well. Uh, pregnant women have a high incidence of morbidity associated with uh, influenza, and that's another group that really needs to be protected. Um, and we can't predict from year to year um, how severe uh, influenza is going to be. As you know, the virus changes antigenically each year, uh, and therefore you need to be immunized each year to get the best protection against influenza infection. So this is the most recent data uh, related to this year's um, um, influenza uh, epidemic. And um, I think we, 
this year we had the first pandemic of influenza in this century in 2009, the H1N1 uh, pandemic. This year was predominantly an H3N2 year, uh, but it, it had as many hospitalizations and looks like maybe even more than the pandemic year uh, because H3N2 tends to be more severe and this was a pretty widespread um, uh, infection this year. Um, as you can see, this is as of March 17th. Uh, there's still some significant regional uh, transmission of uh, influenza. A couple of areas still have widespread uh, transmission. Louisiana is now, now down to local transmission of influenza. We see the significant drop in the number of cases um, that we're seeing, but it's still an ongoing season for uh, influenza. Um, as I said, this has been an H3N2 year. This, these are the results of testing of isolates that um, you know, are performed in, in laboratories uh, that report to the CDC. And you can see that uh, um, the predominant strain has been H3N2. There's been a little bit of H1N1. Um, and then very typical towards the spring is when we tend to see more cases of influenza B. So we saw a lot of H3N2, and more recently, we've, the predominant strain we've been seeing is B. B doesn't tend to be as severe as H3N2, but it still causes a significant number of hospitalizations and um, uh, illnesses. Uh, there are two Bs that have been circulating. So currently, um, for a number of years, there's been a co-circulation of H3N2, H H1N1, and two families of B, um, two lineages of B um, co-circulating. Um, and so um, you have a chance, if you're not lucky, to get four different influenza infections during the course of a year. So that's why the vaccine's important. So uh, to sort of mon one way to monitor the severity of an outbreak is to look at uh, pneumonia and influenza deaths uh, that are occurring in a number of cities that uh, CDC um, ma maintains a uh, surveillance system in. And the, between these two dark lines is the expected number of, uh, of deaths, and this is the number of deaths recorded each year. And again, for this year, you can see we have a significant in increase in uh, mortality uh, related to this, um, this uh, influenza season. Unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of children die of influenza each year. And of vaccine-preventable diseases in the United States, influenza is number one in terms of mortality of children uh, from vaccine-preventable diseases. So, so far this year, there have been 133 pediatric deaths. Um, if it's as true this year as it's been for past years, the vast majority of children who die of influenza are unimmunized. So um, we know that um, uh, immunization modifies the risk not only of disease, but decreases the risk of mortality. So most children who die um, have uh, not received vaccine, and only half of the children who die of influenza have a known underlying risk factor that would make them more likely to have severe disease. So otherwise healthy children can die of influenza, they can have a severe case, and, and, um, and die of complications of the disease. So that's why it's really important for us to stress um, immunization against influenza. So this is, again, a slide uh, that comes from the current um, um, influenza season. And it shows the uh, number of laboratory-confirmed influenza cases in the variety of hospitals that keep this data for CDC. And it <clears throat> so this is the percentage of individuals who have a specific underlying condition um, with influenza who are hospitalized. And it compares the children to adults. And you can see the most common underlying condition that leads to admission for children um, is asthma. 22% of the children admitted to the hospital uh, are known to have asthma. And then you can see there's a certain, all of the other things that we know increase the risk for complications or severity of infection with influenza are on the list, cardiovascular disorders, chronic lung disease, um, immune suppression, metabolic disorders, and so on, neurologic disorders, neuromuscular. Um, but 
Very importantly, nearly 50% of children admitted to the hospital with influenza do not have a underlying known condition which would increase their risk of disease. So again, we know that severe influenza can occur in otherwise healthy individuals with no underlying uh, risk factor, and yet uh, if you have an underlying risk factor, it certainly increases your risk for severe disease and hospitalization. Of women who are in childbearing age who end up in the hospital, over 29.4% um, are pregnant. So that gives you a good idea of the increased risk of morbidity associated with influenza uh, during pregnancy. So um, in the news, there was a lot of concern that this year's influenza vaccine wasn't going to work. Um, the experience in Australia with the H3N2 uh, outbreak in their influenza season, which ends as ours begins, was that the vaccine was only 10% effective. And so that led to a lot of news um, articles, uh, TV stories about how bad this vaccine was going to work this year. And it certainly led, as I'm sure you've heard from your patients, that they've chosen not to get vaccine or they don't have their children vaccinated because the vaccine is not going to work. Well, it's not true. The vaccine works differently every year based on the fact that we have to choose which vaccine strains are going to be included in the vaccine in February for that fall. And sometimes the virus changes in antigenically from that time, so we don't have a good match. So there are seasons where the vaccine doesn't work as well as others. Um, and overall, this vaccine doesn't work as well as the other vaccines that we have to prevent disease in children. However, um, <clears throat> this year turned out to be better than anticipated. And this is some preliminary data that was just published by uh, CDC. Uh, they have a, uh, a, a, a influenza vaccine um, effectiveness network, a number of, org of uh, clinics across the United States. And um, they will evaluate any child or adult that comes in uh, for an acute respiratory illness that's influenza-like. And they will <clears throat> culture those indiv individuals or determine if they are infected with influenza and what type, and then based on their vaccine history, try and develop a, uh, what the degree of vaccine effectiveness is for uh, this year. So this is preliminary data, just published in MMWR, of over 4,500 children and adults in the early the middle part of the season from five different sites, overall vaccine efficacy or effectiveness was 36%. Um, it's less effective in older individuals. It's less effective in individuals who have underlying medical conditions, but it's more effective in children. So if you look at children six months to eight years of age, vaccine effectiveness was almost 60%. And uh, against the H3N2 strain, it was 51%. So there were very few isolates of H1N1 and very few isolates of B, so they had to combine uh, children from six months to 18 years of age. And, but look at the effectiveness against H1N1, 78% and 36% for B. So when the, the vaccine worked a lot better than people thought it would, and, and again, some of the press that it gets makes people not want to get the vaccine when, in fact, even with this degree of efficacy, there are hundreds of thousands of people who will not get infected and thousands of people who will not be hospitalized because of the effectiveness of the vaccine, even at this level. So this is an interesting paper <coughs> that was published in uh, Procedures of Natural Academy of Sciences, and Dr. Venturi may have to help me explain this one. But um, what, you know, for years, the way we've made influenza vaccine is by um, taking the strains that uh, we expect to circulate, adapting them to eggs so that they will be able to be grown in eggs in high enough numbers to develop a good stock of vaccine. So we take the, the virus, adapt it so we get a, <clears throat> a type, uh, a, an adapted strain that will grow quite well. That's what makes up the vaccine. So, <clears throat> Just to kind of go through this, what these investigators did <coughs> was they looked at the isolates of influenza H3N2 that were 
um, identified over the course from 2012 to 2017. And they noticed that there was a significant antigenic change in hemagglutinin. And hemagglutinin is really important because that is the, the, the protein uh, spike off the virus that enables the virus to attach to the cell to begin the cycle of, uh, of infection. Um, so antibody to this, um, uh, this site, the uh, K160, um, is a strong neutralizing antibody that helps neutralize this, this virus. So there was a uh, significant mutation um, at this site uh, that substitute, substituted threonine at this site, so that now T160, and then you can see that very rapidly Virtually all of the H3N2s had this mutation. So <clears throat> they realized when they, when they did studies that uh, if you compared the immune response, a neutralization antibody in animals, ferrets are the animal that um, are, is used uh, to um, determine um, antibody responses to vaccine, to influenza, uh, because it's a good animal model for influenza for uh, human infection. They found that uh, strains that, that um, had this uh, mutation um, um, versus strains that, that, um, that, that did not, there was a difference in neutralization antibody uh, form and that the, the, the strains that didn't have the T160 mutation um, induced an antibody response that did not neutralize very well the T160 mutant. So it turns out that then they went to look at the vaccine virus that uh, was adapted to egg, uh, uh, um, egg growth, and they found that, that in fact, that virus um, had, uh, uh, as part of its ability to grow in eggs, had had a back mutation to the K160 um, type, back mutation to the K. So then they um, immunized um, a group of patients humans with three different influenza vaccines. Um, one is the classic um, uh, flu vaccine that's made in embryonated chicken eggs. One is a uh, vaccine that's now available for 18-year-olds and, and above that's made in cell lines, flu cell vax. It's made in a canine kidney cell line. And then flu block, which is a recombinant um, vaccine where the genes for the specific uh, hemagglutinin proteins are actually incorporated into a cell line that then produces those proteins and that makes the vaccine. So this is the only one that matched the T160. Um, these, this has the, the back mutation. And if you look at the antibody response to the vaccines in humans who received one of these three vaccines, the only one that had a significant ability to block um, the, the circulating H3N2 types was the one that was made by recombinant protein. So um, basically by adapting the virus to eggs, this might be one of the reasons why we don't have as strong a vaccine as we thought we did um, because now we have a back mutation that reduces effectiveness. And then there was no real effect for with the K160 antibody as expected. So um, it turns out that this group um, has already looked at the H3N2 that's been adapted for egg growth for next year's vaccine, and it has the same back mutation. So we, we don't, we're not there yet uh, in terms of the egg <coughs> production of vaccine, but it is turning out clinically that flu block may turn out to be a better influenza vaccine than the embryonated egg ones. And the only problem is it's been studied in children, doesn't work as well in children as the embryonated eggs, at least by initial studies. So um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But this may be one of the reasons why influenza vaccine doesn't work as well as we like it to. Now, um, last thing about influenza um, is that um, I already mentioned that, number one, it's really important to immunize pregnant women because um, they have a significantly high risk of um, morbidity associated with um, influenza. And actually, with the H1N1 pandemic, 
there was a high degree of mortality amongst pregnant women. Um, but um, if we immunize pregnant women, it turns out we also protect their children under six months of age. And so um, um, I think that um, this study was a really nice one, but there, there are multiple studies now available that show the same outcome. This is uh, Intermountain um, um, Health Group. Um, and uh, they looked at a large number of women and their infants uh, during influenza uh, season. Only 10% of the women had gotten influenza immunization. But if you look at the relative risk for an encounter for the infant um, uh, during the first um, uh, six months of life, um, an influenza-like illness encounter, if the mom had been vaccinated, was reduced by... Um, uh, about 64 uh, percent. Confirmed influenza was reduced by 70 percent, and hospitalizations were reduced by um, about 81 um, percent. So, pretty remarkable ability to protect babies from influenza by immunizing their moms. So that's another reason for um, um, giving moms vaccine. Unfortunately, as of last year's data, only about half of moms are actually getting influenza vaccine during pregnancy. So again, this is another group that um, we need to be talking to our obstetricians about um, and uh, making sure that we're increasing their immunization rate. So other things that we do to protect babies that are under six months of age, in addition to maternal immunization, we want to make sure we're immunizing everybody around a newborn baby. Um, we want to uh, recognize influenza when it occurs. This is one of the groups that we want to treat with um, an antiviral if they have influenza. Um, and um, we do the same thing for their contacts to, again, try and reduce the likelihood that they're going to become infected. So last thing about influenza, uh, the composition of next year's vaccine has just been announced, uh, I think, on February 22nd. Um, two changes. Uh, there will be a new H3N2, and one of the oops, one of the Bs has been changed um, as well. But like I said, um, this virus already has that back mutation, and so we'll see what that brings um, in, in terms of coverage. But again, we don't know uh, what, which of these viruses is likely to emerge as the predominant strain next year. Um, one thing that the, CD, that the ACIP uh, did was, as you know, we haven't used live attenuated influenza vaccine for three seasons now uh, because when they went to a quadrivalent vaccine, it turned out that they had decreased effectiveness against whatever strain was the predominant one. And so for the past few years, it has been recommended that we do not use that vaccine. The manufacturer uh, and others have presented data to ACIP indicating that they believe they have fixed the problem. So ACIP has agreed to include uh, the live attenuated vaccine on the schedule for next year. So we'll see. Um, if the manufacturer can meet the FDA requirements, that vaccine will be, again, licensed for the next, next flu season and we'll have it available. There is some concern, and actually the Committee on Infectious Diseases, AAP committee, is meeting first week in April, and we'll discuss this decision and see if they will agree to harmonize, in this case, with the uh, ACIP or come out with a different recommendation. Um, and the concern is that um, it, because we've had an H3N2 year, um, they do, the uh, manufacturer does not have any data on whether the new formulation actually protects against H1N1. And if that becomes the next strain that's predominant, we're really going to be using a vaccine that we do not know how effective it will be. And so that we'll see how the COID um, comes down on that and whether that, that will change their recommendation. Um, and uh, again, um, no preference this year for either um, LAIV or uh, inactivated influenza or trivalent versus quadrivalent vaccine. So the next subject I want to talk about is the um, uh, new guidance that <coughs> is directed towards uh, trying to eradicate perinatal uh, hepatitis B infection. Um, 
there is a significant effort being made now to uh, eradicate hepatitis B uh, from, the, from the world. Um, world Health Organization has set a target of 2030 as um, trying to eradicate hepatitis B. Um, in the United States, we've had a marked reduction in cases of hepatitis B, over 90% reduction in, in new cases. Um, and yet, um, one of the problems that still exists is perinatal transmission. Um, the CDC has data that indicates that nearly 1,000 children each year in the United States are still being infected by uh, hepatitis B due to perinatal transmission. And that's in spite of all of the guidance that that has been out there to try and control this and prevent this from happening. Um, so the new recommendation is that every infant gets hepatitis B vaccine before they leave the nursery and within 24 hours of life. So this shows you the, the <clears throat> incidence of acute hepatitis B by age group in the United States. And as you can see, um, if you look at uh, uh, children, down to almost uh, zero cases. Um, again, the only pocket that remains as an important one for infants is the uh, perinatal uh, transmission. Decrease in every age group, but you can see that we sort of plateaued for adults in a number of different age groups in terms of where we are. Um, and so that's led the CDC to make efforts to try and find more adults who may be at risk, but also um, it's really important that we control perinatal infection because about 30 to 40 percent of the cases of chronic disease that now exist in the world are the result of perinatal transmission. And the reason for that is that if a baby acquires hepatitis B from its mother, um, or acquires hepatitis B in, by exposure within the first year of life, that infant has a 90% chance of becoming a carrier, whereas adults have about a 10% chance of becoming a carrier. So fewer infections, but a much higher rate of carriage. And then, of course, within the next 25 to 30 years, we begin to see the severe sequelae of that chronic infection, either uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or uh, cirrhosis. So um, it's really important that even though we've reduced the overall infection rate uh, by 90 percent plus uh, since we started the hepatitis B vaccine policy, um, we still have this many cases of perinatal infection. Um, and so new effort to try and control this. So the data that the CDC has is that the First, of, the first problem is that infants are not identified as being at risk. So even though the recommendation is that all pregnant women get tested for hepatitis B surface antigen, sometimes they don't get tested. And in other cases, they get tested, but either the maternal test results are misinterpreted, there's a transcription error as to what's, uh, what's written down in terms of what's positive, what's, what's negative. Um, or somebody misinterprets the test result. And I think we've all seen that happen. Um, and it's really important that people understand the different markers for hepatitis B and know how to, what they each mean. Um, and then when we have babies that are specifically, uh, that are exposed, in some cases, the babies are either not getting the initial uh, management that they need, or they're not completing the immunization schedule on time which puts them at increased risk for failure of the vaccine. <coughs> so this is a CDC study that was just published last year um, that shows that um, somewhere, in a, uh, this is a uh, database that includes a large number of uh, pe women in the U.S. Uh, population. 88% of commercially insured women were getting uh, screened for surface antigen. 84% of Medicaid-enrolled women were being screened, um, and 11% um, of the Medicaid moms were not being screened until the third trimester. And that partly could have been because they just entered their, their prenatal care in the third trimester. But that creates some difficulty sometimes in finding the results and getting the results, recording the results uh, properly. So. <clears throat> 
Again, um, for the babies born to a mother who's surface antigen positive, um, all babies, all birth weights, they need hepatitis B vaccine and, and H big within 12 hours of birth. And um, I think we got a good track record here when mom is identified of making that happen. The problem that we have is getting those babies back for follow-up so they get their second and third doses on time. And that's some effort that we would need to make. Um, for uh, maternal, uh, for moms that are surface antigen negative, um, you know, the, it depends on their birth weight. If they're 2,000 grams or greater, they get um, hepatitis B vaccine within 24 hours. If they're under 2,000 grams when they're born, we delay that first dose until they're a month of age or at hospital discharge, whichever comes first. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's a very important strategy, um, and, and we, this is what we need to make sure that we're doing. Um, and for moms who do, we don't know their surface antigen status when they're born, the effort should be made to, um, to get that as soon as possible. But if we don't have it, they get vaccine within 12 hours, and then we follow the rest of the tree based on their, um, their birth weight. Um, and depending on whether we can get the result. So this is the big change. Okay, so why are we going to do that? Creates a safety net, make sure that everybody gets the first dose of vaccine if there's been a mix-up. Um, we know that um, uh, right now the first dose by three days of age, by a survey through 2015, this is the, these are the numbers that we had. Only 71% of infants at, by, uh, in 2015 we're getting their first dose by three days of age. And in a study in, in British Columbia, if the first dose was delayed for one or two months, there was a fourfold increase in, in hepatitis B infection rate. So it's very clear that that infant dose before they leave the nursery is very important. Um, so those of you who are third years, fourth year med peds who are going out into the real world, wherever you go, make sure that your hospital has a policy uh, that every infant uh, gets the, uh, uh, their first dose within 24 hours, and if they're under 2,000 grams, that they get their first dose when they either are in the hospital and get to be 2,000 grams or when they go home. Now, <clears throat> post-exposure prophylaxis, in addition to that first dose of vaccine and H big for moms who are born, babies born to surface antigen positive moms, if we complete the three-dose series on time, the effectiveness is 94%. So we can reduce by uh, that number of that percentage the number of cases of maternal infant transmission um, by using this protocol. We want to make sure that when the babies have completed that protocol, that it's been successful. Uh, so one to two months after the third dose, we want those babies to be tested for antibody to surface antigen. If they have antibody uh, 10 um, milli international units per ml or greater, they're protected. If you find that they don't have antibody or antibody less than 10 and their surface antigen test is negative, they need an additional dose of vaccine so that we can make sure that you develop appropriate antibody response. If they have surface antigen at that time, we know that we have failed to protect them. So we really want to follow up and make sure that these babies develop a protective antibody response uh, so that um, they are protected. The new thing that, um, that has been added to the regimen for uh, treatment and evaluation of, of, uh, of mothers who are surface antigen positive, it, um, we now have a number of studies that show that um, antiviral therapy given to a mother can lower the attack rate and improve outcome of prophylaxis. Um, and so the CDC now recommends that a mother who is surface antigen positive be tested for a hepatitis B viral load. And there is some data that if the viral load is uh, greater than 200,000 international units of uh, hepatitis B DNA, that antiviral therapy may further reduce the transmission rate uh, to those babies. And there have been a number of drugs that have been tested. Uh, tenofovir now has sort of become the, 
the favored, um, and there is now a set of recommendations that the CDC supports, even though they're based on limited information, uh, that women who have a viral load of 200,000 or greater should be treated in the third trimester uh, to help reduce the viral load and reduce the incidence of transmission. Uh, the next thing is uh, biologic modifiers and rotavirus. Um, a lot of uh, women are now receiving uh, biologic modifiers to control inflammatory bowel disease, to, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a number of other um, um, uh, disorders. Um, and um, it turns out that, um, and as you know, during therapy with a biologic modifier, uh, we don't want to give live attenuated vaccines uh, because of the risk of, 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 a, of a persistent infection based on uh, the fact that the immune response has been altered. So <clears throat> this is a study that shows that um, now what, often what obstetricians do is, uh, is that when a, a woman becomes pregnant, they'll try and stop the biologic modifier. Uh, to try and re, re, uh, improve the immune response uh, during pregnancy. So this is a study looking at 44 women who were getting infliximab for inflammatory bowel disease, and every baby born to these mothers had infliximab in their cord blood. So it's being transmitted to the baby, and it takes a long time for that to go away. It turns out that the mean time for clearance was over seven months. And five infants had detectable infliximab um, out to nine months, one to 12 months. So are we immune suppressing these babies? Maybe. So um, <clears throat> this is one study that was just published that looks at a group of women who are in a registry um, um, who, um, um, that um, follows pregnant women who are receiving a variety of different um, immunomodulators, biologics, um, um, and looking at the outcome of their, of, of their pregnancies. So this one study just looked at antibody response to uh, homophilus influenza and tetanus, and it showed that there was no real, there was no significant difference in the antibody response to uh, those antigens. But we really don't know about rotavirus. And rotavirus, as you know, is a live attenuated uh, vaccine. Um, so there's concern that we do know that um, if rotavirus is given to a baby that has SCID, severe combined immune deficiency, they have a prolonged <clears throat> uh, infection, uh, pro diarrhea, and, and, um, and so it's possible that by altering the, the cellular immune response, we may see the same thing in babies. So um, we don't have enough data, but there are some interim recommendations that we suspend the use of rotavirus babies that are born to mothers who have been given um, uh, mod biologic um, uh, products that modify the immune response. So if they have a biologic response modifier uh, therapy, uh, we don't know um, how long after the, um, the uh, drug has been discontinued that the immune <coughs> response is uh, um, returned to normal. Uh, so um, it's now recommended that we do not give rotavirus to these babies um, if their moms had been given this drug at any time during their pregnancy. So that's a change. Okay, and then all of you know about measles um, and the fact that we see measles because parents are choosing not to have their children vaccinated, uh, but uh, now we also have a problem with mumps. Um, and this is a different problem. This is not that patients are not being immunized. This is the fact that over time, the immune response, the protective response to mumps vaccine appears to wane. Um, not that it's, it's uh, a big problem. 85% uh, of individuals who had two doses of, of mumps vaccine are still protected 20 or so years out. But that 85% is not enough to prevent transmission in closed uh, circumstances. So this is the most recent exposure. Um, the National Cheerleaders uh, competition in Dallas just uh, um, uh, a few weeks ago, 
Somebody had mumps, and now they're worried that over 23,000 um, athletes potentially were exposed to mumps and went all the way, went all over the country. So we'll see what happens uh, with that. Um, so all of you know mumps. Um, in the vaccine era, we're now beginning to see, uh, we had really good control. We're now beginning to see some outbreaks of mumps. And, and as I said, these are mostly in closed groups. There was a group, a big outbreak in Arkansas in 2016, but this was amongst a group of individuals who chose not to be, have their children vaccinated. So this wasn't uh, waning immunity, this was uh, lack of protection. Um, so you can see that there have been a number of cases of uh, mumps each year reported in the United States. Um, and, um, um, and so we are seeing these outbreaks. So you need to be aware that when you see a child with peritiditis, you have to think about mumps in the differential, even if that child's been immunized, and especially if they're in college or belong to a close-knit religious group where there is a lot of, lot of close personal interaction. And so that's where we're seeing this. So um, 150 outbreaks um, just within this time frame of January 2016 to June of last year. Um, some are pretty small. Median age of the patient is about 21 years. Immuni uh, university community, some other schools, and again, the vast majority of people have had two doses of vaccine, um, and it looks like two doses of vaccine is still effective. 88% effectiveness uh, in these outbreaks, but increasing risk with longer time since uh, MMWR, the second dose given. The complication, mumps it tends to be milder in the patients who've had two doses. There's a decreased risk of orchitis compared to natural infection in that age group. Um, and the CDC began looking at the possibility of a third dose of MMR vaccine to try and control outbreaks. Uh, there's limited data, but uh, at least in, in one outbreak, the secondary, the attack rate was much lower in vaccine recipients than who got the third dose than those that did not. So the latest recommendation is that um, in an outbreak, if public health decides that there's an outbreak, so you want to, uh, if you have a patient with, with uh, peritiditis, you want to report that, you want to evaluate for mumps, uh, uh, viruses, because there are many other viruses that cause peritiditis as well, as you know, um, and then get public health involved so that if there is an outbreak, we can start planning for um, third dose uh, to help, help try and control it. Um, hepatitis A, um, I just want to show a couple things about hepatitis A. Um, again, marked reduction in cases of hepatitis A with the introduction of the vaccine. And here's the um, children zero to nine uh, years of age. Um, again, we're getting really good control, marked reduction in cases in adults, but again, things have plateaued. And actually, for a couple of age groups, there's actually some increase in cases. There have been outbreaks of hepatitis A predominantly amongst um, uh, homeless individuals and amongst individuals who are IV drug abusers. And so the opioid um, uh, crisis has certainly potentially contributed to this, as well as possibly to outbreaks of uh, hepatitis B. The problem that we have with uh, hepatitis A is twofold. One is that not everybody is giving the vaccine to children like it's recommended. So across the country in 19 to 35 year olds, only 61% um, have gotten their appropriate doses and fewer adolescents are leaving practices with, uh, without being caught up with, with uh, hepatitis B. So it's really important to make sure that we're giving the vaccine as recommended starting at uh, one year of age. Um, and that uh, if we have older children in our practices who are not immunized as younger children, make sure you catch them up. Um, and then for HPV, um, remember that we're now 12 years into the uh, HPV vaccine program. Uh, girls, 2006, the recommendation was made. Boys, 2011, we now have uh, 
the nine valent vaccine that was uh, licensed in 2014 is the only vaccine that we have now. Um, and we now have a two dose schedule for individuals younger than 15 years, strong safety record, and we're already seeing significant effects of the vaccine. Um, the um, manifestations, as you know, most individuals who are infected will never know it. They have an asymptomatic infection, which will resolve within uh, two years. Um, but those that have persistent infection are the ones we worry about because if they have persistent infection with the high risk type, outcome may be um, cancer. And so this is a very important virus that is associated with the production of cancer, also produces genital warts, and a rarer syndrome that's really important for young children called juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, where the organism produces um, uh, a series of papillomas within the respiratory tract, larynx, and, and then down uh, into the trachea and bronchi, uh, which require multiple excisions and, and uh, uh, can uh, often obstruct the airway and cause sudden death. So that's an important syndrome. Um, and then genital warts uh, um, are, are very common associated with uh, two of the low risk types, type 6 and 11. Uh, over 30,000 cases of cancer in the United States due to HPV. Uh, so the vaccine is predominantly designed to prevent cancer. Um, this past year, the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer surpassed the incidence of cervical cancer. So we have a significant uh, increasing incidence of oropharyngeal cancer related to this virus. So it takes about 20 to 30 years before HPV-associated cancers develop. So when someone has a persistent infection with a high-risk type, they tend to have increasingly abnormal cell replication, which in cervical cancer can be identified by pap testing. So one of the things that's really changed the incidence of cervical cancer is pap testing, because you can find the precancerous lesions and remove the, the precancers before they develop into cancer and then spread. Um, however, in spite of having pap testing, there's still about 10,000 cases of cervical cancer diagnosed each year in the United States and 4,000 deaths. So um, it's, um, it, it's a good way to reduce cancer incidence, but vaccine is a, is a primary prevention and, 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 and enables women not to have to go through um, the, the procedures that are necessary to remove the pre-malignant cells. Um, so we don't really expect to see a change in cancer rates related to the vaccine for a number of years. However, we can look at some early outcomes to determine how effective the vaccine is by looking at prevalence of infection and genital warts, prevalence of infection with the types that are in the vaccine, and then we can start looking at these earlier um, Cytopla uh, cytoplasmic changes, the, the cervical intraepithelial neoplasias that are associated with increasingly abnormal cell development with uh, persistent infection with the um, high-risk oncogenic types. Um, so this just shows you that we already have significant evidence of population impact on type prevalence in multiple countries decreased incidence of genital warts, and we're already beginning to see now some of these middle type um, um, effects by reduced intraepithelial neoplasias related to the vaccine types. So the, the vaccine types are not circulating the way they did, and there are less lesions associated with uh, vaccine types. And I just want to show you some U.S. data. Um, this is a series of studies that are, have, are done by the CDC called the, the National, National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys. These are population-based surveys where the, the patients selected represent the U.S. population. And prior to the introduction of the vaccine, they began to ask uh, women who were in the, um, in the study to self-collect a cervical vaginal swab that they then tested for HPV types. And you can see that uh, in the pre-vaccine era, 11.5% of girls 14 to 19 years of age had one or more of the four types that were in the 
original quadrivalent vaccine. Type 16 and 18 are responsible for over 70% of the cancers that we see in the United States. Um, now, in the vaccine era, and then now we're up to 2011-2014, there's a 71% reduction in the, in the percentage of individuals carrying one of these four types, a 61% reduction in 20, 24-year-olds, and a 25% reduction in the older age group through 29. So significant evidence of uh, vaccine effectiveness. Type 6, 18, and 18, even through 2012, were reduced by 60%. And of individuals who had reported one or more doses of vaccine, vaccine effectiveness was about 83%. So this is pretty strong evidence of a early effect when, in fact, we have less than 50% of adolescents fully immunized against, this, these, um, against HPV at the present time. So um, very important data that shows a, a very early um, effect for the vaccine. And now we have our first evidence that um, this vaccine will also prevent the juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. In Australia, they began a campaign where they immunized all girls, now they immunize all boys as well. They did much better than we did. They had 80% of the population immunized within a couple of years. Um, and um, then they began looking at the incidence of uh, juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Um, they have a, a pediatric rare disease surveillance unit. They collected data on, um, on cases, and there's been a significant reduction in the cases of juvenile uh, onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. So um, this is an added benefit of the vaccine, and this is the first evidence that uh, we're controlling this infection by immunizing moms. The vast majority of cases of uh, juvenile onset um, or RP are due to 6 and 11, reduced circulation, reduced infections of mom, result in reduced transmission of babies. So, um, again, vaccine policy changes, vaccine recommendations change because of these nuances as we learn what's going on based on the effectiveness of the vaccine and then changes in epidemiology. So you're just going to need to keep up with it. And um, a good way to do that is to use these few resources. Um, everything that comes from the ACIP is published in MMWR. They have a website that has the current policies for each of the vaccines that we use. Um, and as I said, you have a new schedule every year that you can put up on the wall. Um, the AEP does the same thing through the Red Book. And then Red Book Online now has uh, all the new policies that are published by the COID in between publications of the Red Book. And in fact, now they're starting to look at modifying specific chapters for vaccine recommendations when new recommendations come out. Um, so um, all of you have the ability to uh, go to Red Book Online. That's a public, uh, uh, well, with, through your uh, uh, resident um, um, with, what is a resident uh, AAP membership, thank you. You can get to Red Book online. Okay, we'll conclude there. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. With hepatitis B, we have very few parents who don't agree to that first immunization, but occasionally. And, um, and we do counsel them and we document you know, what we've gone over and, and things like that. Do we need to consider a form where they could then? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, what some people do is document that in a chart, and that's probably sufficient. Um, there are people who would like a formal documentation signed by the parent. So the AAP does have some, actually, um, documents that you could use if you want to download and then put that into the chart once the mom signed it or the parent signed it. 
So it's your choice, but I think that documentation in the chart that you counsel the family and they've refused the vaccine is probably adequate uh, for most situations. That's primarily what we're doing. Uh, some of them plan to have it done with their primary care provider. Yeah. Occasionally we have, unfortunately, one of the people who have an experience with autism in their family. Right. And so it's all, whatever we say, it doesn't matter. It's right. just all the vaccines are, are lumped into that, even yeah. though we try to educate them on yeah. the balance of that. Yeah, and I, that's important. And, and for multiple vaccines over time, that uh, the, the strategy if someone is really um, unwilling to listen is to keep after them with every visit to see if you could convince them over time to change their mind. Yeah, and we do put that in our problem list yeah. as far as because that is the diagnosis code is yeah. parental refusal and we try to make that you know, part of the record so yeah. we can see that. Yeah, and it is very important to document that. Yeah. John. Uh, I, have, I have 18 questions, but um, we can do some later at lunch if you want. Um, related to Hep B, I think it's especially important if mom is known to be antigen positive. And in oh, those yeah, cases, they have, yeah, they have you know, <laughs> right. no choice or CPS. Right. Right. Those are the ones that are The rest of them. Right. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think under those circumstances, you can act as the advocate for the child because now you've got a high-risk situation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I didn't mention, but certainly high viral load and uh, E antigen positive mom are the highest risks for babies um, who moms are surface antigen positive. So um, yes, that would be a time when you might get child protection involved and, and then become the advocate for the child. And that's actually done the way we handle. We just, we just do it. Right. And then I go in and talk to them about why, how important it is to get involved in cancer and things like that. So, my question is uh, one on the biologics and rotavirus vaccine. Do we have any data on biologics in breastfeeding? Because a lot of those moms will be off during pregnancy and right back on yeah. and, and uh, maybe breastfeeding. I don't know of any data. Now, there, there, there may be, but I don't know of any. I'm not aware. And then um, where are we with flu vaccine adjuvants? There, so um, there are a series of different flu vaccines that are now licensed. I already told you about the cell um, source virus that are in the, in the kidney cells, the canine kidney cells. There's the um, common in vaccine, and then there is now, um, uh, and actually this, these vaccines with adjuvants have been used in other countries for many years, and they've proven to be safe, and they've improved effectiveness because they increased the antibody response. So there are some that are being evaluated now that are on their way to potential licensing. Uh, so um, we do have, uh, there are a number of approaches to try and get rid of the egg-based influenza vaccine because we know that they're not the best. And we're using similar technology that we used back in the 1930s when the first vaccines were made. Uh, they've cleaned it up a great deal, but we still have the problem that they're not the best vaccines. And we're now beginning to understand maybe why they're not. And um, so there, there'll be a number of changes over time uh, for what we use. And the last one is um, related to the mumps epidemic in Arkansas. Gary Wheeler is their public health officer, you know, and for the students and, and residents, uh, Gary's an infectious disease specialist. And when you talk to Gary about that epidemic, it turns out that about two thirds of those patients with mumps were uh, from the Marshall Islands. And there's a, a very large population of Marshallese in Arkansas because they have uh, uh, unrestricted travel uh, as a U.S. territory because of some um, terrible things we did to them in the past with nuclear weapons. And, um, and so they, that population was largely unvaccinated and living in um, apartments with 10 and 20 people per apartment uh, kind, of, kind of situations. And, and so a perfect setup for a mumps outbreak. About two thirds of the several thousand cases were in Marshallese. All 
Arkansas and don't be a cheerleader. Yeah, don't be a cheerleader in Arkansas. You're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.